Well, Tashi Dale, and welcome back. We are now on week nine of our 100-day retreat now. So we're starting with the 57th day in the text. And so last time we started with the examination of the teacher. And so basically you have to imagine now that we've selected somebody to follow, our guru, who we want to learn from and so forth. And so we do our regular preliminary practices. And I wanted to start off here. Uh, this starts on in the in the book on page 143, the words of my perfect teacher. But if you go to page 145, in the middle paragraph there, I thought was uh, also helpful at this point. There are three ways to please the teacher and serve him or her. The best way is known as offering of practice. So in other words, the best thing you can do is do the practice. So when you've received the teachings about doing the practice, the best thing that you can do is to actually do the practice. And consists of putting whatever he or she teaches into practice with determination, disregarding all hardship. Building towers, tearing them down, <laughs> all those sorts of things. The middling way is known as service with body and speech and involves serving him or her, doing whatever he or she needs you to do, whether physically, verbally, or mentally. So if they need help getting something done, then we help them do that to the best of our ability. The lowest way is by material offerings, which means to please your teacher by giving him or her material goods, food, money, and so forth. And of course, the lamas need that kind of thing too. They do not work for pay per se. And so they have living expenses to pay for just like we do. So it helps them to give those kind of things, even though it may not be the highest level of generosity in this case. But that's an important thing to keep in mind as a part of this. Then move over to page um, 145. Oh, well, that was 145. Okay, the, the, the one I was going to do, 144, so I'm going to go backwards here a little bit, is the first paragraph below the indented quote at the top of the page. A courageous disciple, armored with determination never to displease his teacher, even at the cost of his life, so stable-minded that he is never shaken by intermediate circumstances, who serves his teacher without caring about his own health or survival and obeys his every command without sparing himself at all, will be liberated simply through his devotion to the teacher. Okay. So part of the idea here is that this is something that's really important. Now, the word guru itself, or lama, both the same thing in Sanskrit and Tibetan, uh, has a sense of weightiness to that. You may have read that before, where it's, it's like gold or something. It has a, a certain weightiness beyond just the word teacher has. And so that's the importance of the idea of devotion to the teacher and be willing to go a little bit further than we normally would with a school teacher like myself, you, or <laughs> some other school teachers that we've had. Um, so that that's an important idea to keep that across. The, the, the teacher, the guru in particular, is trying to help us the best, the, to the best of their ability. Now, they may not be perfect either. As we saw last time when we were looking at examining the teacher, there are no perfect teachers anywhere. Okay, So you're kidding yourself if you have those kinds of expectations. Uh, they're all going to have some issues here or there, or we're not going to agree with them on one thing or another. And, and that's just reality. We need to be aware of that. But what we're talking about here is our letting go of that and seeing them as a Buddha. You know, visualizing them above the crown of our head and so forth. And considering that they are the Buddha's representative, they're doing the best that they can right now, and they're trying very hard to help you attain enlightenment. Okay, so they're making a serious commitment to you as well. 
not just you to them. Okay? The devotion, in a way, goes both directions. So that, those are the things that I wanted to point out in particular before we get into this 57th day about how to follow your guru here. So for this day, after the preliminary instructions, we are to continue our contemplation with the focus on how to follow our guru, which includes three categories. First, always be of service to the guru to fulfill his or her needs. Offer the guru your assistance and support as much as you can. And especially, make your guru happy by le learning and practicing the Dharma well. So those are the same three things that we just saw, a little bit different order, but you get the idea here. Then, you don't want to upset the guru either. Now I would say you don't want to upset anybody. Okay, this isn't particularly unique to the guru, but it receives special emphasis in this context. And, but if your guru asked you to perform something that was illegal and made obstacles to your family relationships and so forth, then you can tell the guru with a pleasant voice, you know, so you don't yell and scream or anything like that, I'm very sorry, with great respect, I cannot do this. And I would add, and why? You know, don't just say, I can't do it, but why you feel you can't do this. And all of the gurus that I have met would accept that. Okay? That doesn't mean that they always will. They may, for one reason or another, say, I'm sorry, but you need to do this. That can happen. Um, they may have other reasons which they may or may not explain to you. But uh, building a bunch of towers was done for a reason. And then tearing them down, and building more, tearing them down, building more, and so forth. For, for uh, Millerapa, was that Millerapa that did those? Uh, that is, that's the kind of thing that a guru might do, is to say, you need to push yourself a bit. You need to do something more than uh, what you're saying up front, at least, that you're willing to do. Now, there are exceptions to that, which we'll talk a little bit more about here just momentarily. Um, but in the teaching here, Rinpoche says, otherwise, whatever the guru asks, you need to always say yes and never no. Even if the guru is wrong, you should still not make a big deal and never debate the guru, but only answer yes. Generally, if you practice Mahayana doctrine, and especially Tantrayana, you need to recognize and respect the guru as a Buddha, like I was just mentioning, and follow wherever he or she has, whatever he or she has said, whenever possible. A little caveat there, whenever possible. So if there's some reason that you simply can't do what they're asking you to do, then you need to explain that to them and, and not just provoke it or argue with them or anything like that. Uh, then he continues on to say there are no human rights regarding the relationship between a guru and you. You cannot take actions based on human rights principles regarding the relationship between the guru and you. Human rights issues that violate the law uh, may be all right to follow the law. I would say it is all right to follow the law, but um, it's illegal from a Dharma point of view because following the guru is the point, is the root of the practice on the path to enlightenment. So you would ruin the root of the practice of the great vehicle, Dharma. So you wouldn't have any chance to of realization with this guru if you were to do those. Now, like I said, there are some exceptions, and it does have a little weasel word in here, in a place or two, in terms of doing these kinds of things. Uh, Patrol Rinpoche, in the words of my perfect teacher, says, there are lots of charlatans around, okay? You don't have to do something that a charlatan is asking you to do. Um, it was a real good article in one of the magazines recently. I think I came across this uh, online uh, by uh, Mingya Rinpoche uh, from October 26th of 2017. And the title of the article is When a Buddhist Teacher Crosses the Line. 
and he talks about a variety of things. Uh, there's been a lot of things in the news in the last couple of years about lamas who crossed the line in terms of uh, sexual issues, and he does talk about that, but that's not the main theme of this particular article, but it's more broad than that. Uh, talking about the, the teacher-student relationship, uh, and he points out that people don't ask very much about ethics. Um, they're asking about all kinds of other things, and, but they very rarely ask, ask about that. Uh, but ethics is at the foundation. That was the first thing that the Buddha had to learn before he could learn to meditate was ethics. And the same really holds true for us. The three trainings that the, the Buddha talked about is ethics was first, number one, then meditation, and then wisdom. And so ethics is very important as a part of that. And that actually holds for the guru just like it does for the practitioner. So we need to keep that in mind. Uh, he points out that the Buddha lived a life of kindness, humility, and compassion, lived by example. And I think that's an important thing to consider. Uh, now, usually we can see when there are problems, when we do what was the last of our trainings here on the 100-day retreat of trying to examine the teacher, look at their behavior and see, do they practice ethics? Are they following the ethical guidelines and so forth? We don't always know exactly what vows a particular teacher has taken, but we should look at those and see, are they practicing in an ethical manner or not? And I've seen lamas who do and lamas who don't, at least in some ways. So we have to be careful about those. Uh, my advice is to stay away from those that you have concerns about their, their ethical practices. Um, and then looking at their lineage background and so forth, that's an important thing that he mentions. Uh, and he talks about different approaches in the different uh, vehicles of Buddhism, whether it's individual liberation, great compassion, or what he calls indestructible wakefulness, which would be Vajrayana. He goes on to talk a little bit about uh, then ethics in Buddhism and the kinds of things that are included at these different levels across those three different vehicles. And uh, points out that the point of the practice here is our practice should bring out the best in us as human beings, our inner wisdom, our basic sanity, the moral compass and that moving closer to the simple ideals of kindness, humility, honesty, and wisdom, and none of us should, or none of us will act perfectly in every situation, but over time we should basically follow those kinds of, of values. So then he at, points out that this is especially true with spiritual teachers. So it applies to all of us, but especially to teachers. Uh, teachers should act as role models, for example, and guides and so forth. And so teachers need to, to do those things in order to kind of practice what you preach, if you will. Uh, then he talks a little bit about finding a genuine teacher. So this is a little bit more like the things that we were talking about last week, looking at their lineage and uh, that they promote the lineage, not themselves. It's something a little bit different than, than what was in our text last week. Um, but if something's not quite right, then you need to be concerned about that. If the teacher has studied and practiced and uh, with other respected teachers, they honor their lineage and so forth, its values, traditions, and so forth, that's a good sign. Those are the kind of things that you look for. Uh, a second point that he makes is the commitment to study and practice. Be sure the person knows the path firsthand. They, they have a clear commitment to their own practice and training. So they're not just trying to train you. They, they've got some experience in doing these kinds of things. The third one, third quality is compassion, which is we see mentioned a lot in the process of examining a teacher. Uh, because we want to be sure that the teacher's on our side, that they are trying to help us and not just themselves. Um, they have our interests uh, at heart and deeply care about us and our progress. So trust is very critical as a part of that. The fourth one then that he mentions is upholding their vows and precepts. 
whether they've taken uh, monastic or lay vows, the Bodhisattva vows, the Vajrayana Samaya vows, or whatever. And we don't always know that. Uh, and it's not an easy thing to do in a literal way. Nobody's perfect. Some people um, occasionally uh, do things that are not perfect. Uh, he points out uh, it's not easy to find a perfect teacher. And, but they should have all of these qualities to some degree. I'm not saying they have to be perfect, but they should have them to some degree. If a teacher is completely lacking one or more of these, it's probably best to move on. Okay. And then another thing that he talks about here that I think is important that is not in our teachings has to do with leaving a teacher. Okay, actually Rinpoche I think talks a little bit about that in here, but uh, Minga Rinpoche says that uh, often we only really get to know the teacher af after becoming their student. We don't necessarily know all of the details, but what happens if they're not quite what we hoped? And so the relationship is very important and it should be to benefit the student, not the teacher. It's not for the teacher's gain or profit, but it is possible that it's not a good fit. And so if you're going to look for another teacher, the best way, the best approach to do that is in terms of it, thinking about it, not that they're a bad teacher, and evaluating, judging them, but that it's not a good fit. Okay, And that happens. Not everybody is a good fit. Not every Sangha is a good fit, and so forth. So we find those that are and you're not going to find a perfect fit either. So you've got to keep both of those. It's kind of a middle way between a perfect fit and, and something really bad. Okay, So you look for something that's at least in the middle there. So he says the best way to leave is without bad-mouthing bad -mouthing the teacher or creating difficulties for those who may be benefiting from the teacher and the community. Leave on good terms or at the very least do not leave on bad terms. Move on with humility. One caveat that he adds here is to be honest with yourself. If you find every teacher unworthy of your time, then you may want to look a little deeper into your own patterns. So it can be difficult to make any progress on the path if you're looking for perfections. Then he continues to talk about serious ethical violations. And so here, uh, talking about people being hurt or laws being broken, those kind of things that Rinpoche was just talking about. Uh, if there are physical or sexual abuse, financial impropriety, or other breaches of ethics, uh, is it in the best interest of students, the community, and ultimately the teacher? It is in their interest to address those issues. So those kind of things just need to come out. There needs to be a discussion, a dialogue about those things. And the safety of the victim comes first. So that should never be violated. Uh, and in our own, uh, we have our own policy for the Sangha that deals with some of those. And in that we say there, there is no room for abuse or exploitation. Okay, that's that's the line. Okay, don't cross that line in any way. Some of the other things are a little bit vague based on the the vows and so forth, but uh, that's that's where you really draw the line. Uh, the appropriate response, he says, depends upon the situation. If a teacher acted inappropriately or harmfully, but acknowledges the wrongdoing and commits to avoiding it in the future, then dealing with the matter internally may be adequate. But if there's a long-standing pattern, or if the abuse is stream, extreme, or if the teacher's unwilling to take responsibility, it is appropriate to bring the behavior out in the open. Okay. So he's drawing a line here. That's a judgment call in terms of how extreme it is. But when it's more extreme, then it needs to be brought out into the open. It is not a breach of Samaya to bring painfully, painful information into light. Naming destructive behaviors is a necessary step to protect those who are being harmed or who are in danger of being harmed in the future. 
Uh, I would add to that it's very important to keep loving kindness and compassion in mind for all of the parties involved in this. Okay? It's very easy to take sides and that's not helpful. Uh, then he continues on a little bit with crazy wisdom. It's an idea that comes up in the Dzogchen practices and so he comments a little bit on that. So the his, with the history of eccentric yogis and yoginis and teachers uh, with crazy wisdom, this can be authentic but unfortunately it's often invoked as a rationalization. And that's, that's you know, it becomes a slippery slope. It's just really hard to say where do you draw the line on some of these things. So he says the most important thing uh, is whether it benefits the student. You know, if you do those kind of things as a teacher or even as a Sangha member with somebody else, you need to keep in mind is at least our intention to benefit the student. Sometimes our intention is good but the results aren't. But our, we do need to have good intention rooted in compassion and wisdom. So even odd, eccentric, and even wrathful kinds of things do not instill fear or anxiety. They bring about a flowering of compassion and wisdom in the student. So that's another way of being able to judge whether or not the, the results are authentic or the actions are authentic based on the results. The results of genuine crazy wisdom always are always positive and visible. Spiritual growth, not trauma. Trauma is a sure sign that the crazy wisdom behavior was missing the wisdom to benefit the student, the compassion that puts the student's interest first uh, or both. So these extreme teaching styles took place in a context of a very mature spiritual bond between teacher and student. They were not all that common. Marpa didn't make all of his students build stone towers. He treated his other students very differently. He saw Milarepa's potential and approach that would benefit him the most. The rest is history. Milarepa became an enlightened and one of Tibet's greatest adepts. So it should only be used with very mature students in the context of a relationship of stable trust and devotion. Also the last resort. So there are four kinds of enlightened activity, peaceful, magnetizing, enriching, and wrathful. You've probably heard of those. Wrathful activity is used for those who are not receptive to more subtle approaches. So again, this style is not a norm. Okay, so there are the stories out there, there are the explanations, but don't assume that's just the way it's done. That's not the case. But it is employed in certain circumstances. We must distinguish teachers who are eccentric or provocative, but ultimately compassionate and skillful from those who are actually harming students. So that's, that's the key there. There are plenty of teachers who push and provoke students to help them learn about their minds, but that is not abuse. Physical, sexual, and psychological abuse are not teaching tools. Okay. And then he concludes with a section here, the Vajrayana in the modern world. Uh, remember, this is a different environment than these were originally taught. So we need to keep that in mind. We Buddhist practitioners are all representing the Buddhist teachings to the world. Uh, do a quick Google search and it makes the entire tradition more transparent. And ethical behavior, ethical violations are more visible than they ever have been. Schools, businesses and other public institutions are expected to adhere to a code of conduct and the laws of the land. Then spiritual organizations should be role models teachers even more so. So they need to model ethical behavior. The core of Vajrayana is to strive to embody pure perception. The thoughts and emotions, even the difficult ones, as manifestations of timeless awareness. So we see every person as a Buddha and we treat them as such. Treating everything and everyone as though we are meeting the Buddha face to face is our main practice in the Vajrayana. 
the very highest ethical standard that we could ascribe to. So I thought it was very good, so I thought it was important that we share that in the context of what we're discussing, what we started last week, but also what we're discussing today. Um, continuing on then with the, the teachings here from Rinpoche in the text, there are some inconsiderate people who have been disparaging in characterizing the practice of a master giving teachings and a student making an offering to the master as a Lama business. Actually, the Dalai Lama, when he was here in Tucson a few years ago, uh, was teasing the Lamas that were up there on stage with him, with him saying that they tend to recite the money is oh money pay me home instead <laughs> oh money pay me home so uh, so he's he's even aware of, of these kinds of issues coming up uh, from a religious point of view the practice of a teacher giving teachings and students reciprocating by making an offering began at the time of the Buddha himself and it's a very common thing to do. I think all of you are aware of that when somebody comes in as a teacher that we make offerings. We even have a little Donna box out there for people to make offerings uh, as well. We do our best to offer as much as we can without uh, asking for any particular fees or anything. There have been instances where a disciple offered his body or the entire kingdom to a master. Compared to those offerings, a simple offering should not be that significant. Uh, most lamas engage in studying and practicing Buddhism from a very young age. They do not, as laid out by the Buddha, engage in business or farming. Whatever a lama, a lama has learned and obtained through experiences is transmitted to the teacher students to benefit this and future lives. Students reciprocate by taking care of the master's needs for livelihood like food and clothing. i tell you a little story, I won't name names here, but one of the things that uh, we were asked to do by a particular Lama was no longer charge for any of our teachings. And so we said, okay, we won't charge for any of our teachings, we'll just ask for donations. And so we started doing that. The next Lama that came to give teachings was upset that we weren't charging for the teachings, uh, that there was no expectation that people uh, make a suggested donation for those particular teachings. So you get Lamas in both of those kinds of uh, approaches to things. But in the United States, uh, we don't have a tradition of wealthy donors keeping, supporting the, uh, the centers, the temples, the monasteries, and so forth, like they had in the East. Some of those became extremely wealthy. People would often, in their wills, donate large, tra large tracts of land and so forth to them, and give them large portions of whatever wealth that they happened to have. And so they benefited from those. Not all of them, but a great number of them did. Uh, but it also created some problems. Sometimes all of that wealth and power goes to your head. And so they also had some issues that came up from those kinds of things. But uh, we want to follow a middle way. You know, whatever we are able to do in terms of contributing and donating uh, that can be helpful for these people, uh, they are doing incredible things, spending lots and lots of hours, uh, days, months, years, trying to do what they can to help us. And so we need to step up and do what we can. We're not asking people to just give away everything they have, uh, like some religious traditions do, but to, to do what you can reasonably do, a middle way. So uh, we have in the West, I was just going to uh, comment on this, he says uh, that we do not do engage in business or farming, uh, but more and more uh, centers around the U.S. have learned that they have to do some business in order to survive, uh, to pay the bills and so forth. So we see Dharma stores and other things that they have done to do that or uh, they ask for donations even though they also say that uh, 
nobody will be turned away from lack of ability to pay or something along that line. Uh, where they do like a lot of our events where we just simply say it's free, but we appreciate whatever donations that we can get from it and so forth. Uh, but there is a little bit of a business element in, involved in that. Uh, there's a lot of kind of, having been a, a professor of business, I can tell you that there are a lot of business people who are not particularly ethical about how they go about doing the business. But there are a lot of people who are as well. Uh, it doesn't have, you don't have to be crooked in the way that you do business. And so uh, we try to encourage people in doing their business to do it in an ethical and a moral way and in a way that also benefits uh, whoever their particular customers happen to be. Okay, so continuing on with Rinpoche here. Uh, he says, it could be said that whether Buddha Dharma survives or not hinges upon the existence of a monk community. Now, I would say it's broader than that now, particularly in the West, where we don't have a large monk community. But there's a certain element of that where uh, that we need people who go through that level of rigorous training in order to continue the teachings of the Dharma. While the existence of a monk community in turn hinges upon the monasteries and monastic seats, for example, the Lamas have restored most of the 6,000 Tibetan monasteries that were destroyed by the Chinese troops in Tibet. This is the main reason why Lamas need funds. Lamas also support and provide teachings to tens of thousands of monks across India, Nepal, and Bhutan. A great number of sick elderly people with hopeless or uh, and hopeless orphans in and outside Tibet are being supported by lamas through monthly stipends. Thus, those who criticize lamas for raising funds must look at the larger picture. Uh, we also, we have a foundation associated with AWAM, the AWAM Foundation, which helps supports an orphanage in Tibet. And we get some grant monies that help do that. We also get donations from different people that help uh, do that. And so people can contribute uh, to that, uh, to help them. Uh, they're learning, uh, they have, we have a school, we have a medical clinic, uh, we have them uh, learning both uh, Chinese language as well as Tibetan language. Uh, they're now learning to do tonka paintings and you know, they're teaching things. One of the first things that we did with them was we helped them uh, buy yaks so they would have a yak herd. Uh, so that they could help become self-supporting. It's turned out that the medical clinic has also helped them become self-supporting. The medical clinic is paying for itself. They sell herbs, uh, medicinal substances that they are able to collect there. They're training other people in medical practices, Tibetan medicine and so forth. And so a lot of, a lot of really good things have, have happened with that with the support of people like us making these donations to help them uh, get by with real basic needs of food, clothing, shelter, and so forth. And so uh, that's part of what is being referred to here, just one example. Uh, so when you practice the great vehicle in Tantrayana vehicle, following the guru is the most important route of the practices, as we talked about above. Thus, please concentrate on these things today and then conclude as we did before by resting your mind and then dedicating the merit as we did before. Now I would just add in this particular one that uh, following the guru, uh, a lot of the, uh, the issues that come up in following the guru could have been alleviated by examining the guru in the first place. I think a lot of people just jump right in without doing that. Um, there are some teachings that say you should do that for a period of 12 years before you take the commitment to really follow that guru. Um, I don't know that it ne needs to be that long. I think most of us are, are fairly savvy and we're not likely to be taken in by somebody like that. Uh, most of them show that side fairly quickly. Uh, rather than after long periods of time, but there are exceptions. I mean, there have been some some things that have happened that have been in the news about lamas where they were widely respected for a long period of time before any of these things appeared. So you never know for sure. 
Let's move on then to the 58th day, the third of these three practices related to the guru. And this one has to do with emulating the guru's realization and actions. So the 58th day instructions continue the teachings on emulating the guru, following the guru. And there are nine examples of how to emulate the guru. One, give up your control and offer everything else to your guru's control. Like a great son who is listening and following the order of his parents. Number two, when anyone including your friend or relative tries to destroy your relationship with your guru, keep the relationship very strong like an unshakable vajra or mountain. Number three, whenever your guru has an activity or work that needs to be done, bear whatever comes like a bridge. You know, whatever comes to the bridge, go over the bridge, unless it's too heavy, then it has to go a different route. <laughs> Uh, but that's the idea. Whatever traffic comes can go over the bridge. Whatever sufferings and difficulty come onto you, never shake the relationship between your guru and you, like the Iron Mountain. Number five, whenever the guru asks you to do lower class work, follow all the instructions and never avoid them, like a servant who is following an order. So if you're asked to do the dishes, sweep the floor, or whatever it is like that, be willing to do those things. Number six, at, the, at all times, give up your ego and keep yourself in a lower position than the guru, like a servant. And a lot of lamas literally do that, where they will bow down, like if they're close to the Dalai Lama, but they're actually taller than the Dalai Lama. I mean, the Dalai Lama is not exactly a really tall person. You know, they, they keep their heads lower than the head of the Dalai Lama. You will see them doing that. And when uh, we're waiting for the Lama to enter, people uh, will bow down uh, as they're coming by. They don't necessarily try to get physically below, but bow down as a way of trying to recognize and honor the teacher as they come in in that way. Uh, number seven, whatever difficult words come from the guru, keep them to yourself, like the earth. Number eight, no matter how much the guru scorns you and looks down on you, you should never respond with anger to the guru, like a dog remains faithful to the owner. Now that one I would have I would have to put a little caveat in there. Um, it depends. They could be scorning you for good reason. Okay, so you have to be a little bit careful about that. On the other hand, they could be abusing you, and so you, you have to be careful about that too. Uh, so you need to think about it, contemplate that, and, and figure out what is really going on here. Um, then number nine, no matter how much you need to go and come for the guru, making errands, they need this or that, you should never feel tired of doing that, like a ship. Ship just comes and goes, hurt, loads up with cargo, takes it, comes back, and so forth. Thus, you need to practice these for your enlightenment. When you have the time, please read the stories of Naropa, Marpa, Milarepa, and so on. Then, if you think, why do I need to respect the Guru so much? There are two reasons. The Guru is a Sanskrit word. The meaning is heavier because it is heavy in quality and heavy for the kindness. For example, even if a Guru knows one verse of the Dharma, the quality is much heavier than one who knows how to make a nuclear bomb and so forth. I'm not sure that's the best analogy, but <laughs> you kind of get the idea. Similarly, if the Guru gave to one gave you one instruction of the Dharma, this kindness is much heavier than your parents and friends who give you money, a house, land, and so on. This is so because these instructions could save you from inconceivable sufferings and samsara, and for many lifetimes you can gain a shining life, and after that you can achieve Buddhahood. So if you keep it in that context of the significance of the teaching, uh, then what it's saying here about that weightiness, that heaviness, makes sense. For example, if you had the karma to be born as a dog in your next life and this dog was eaten by another, but now you have met a guru and received dharma teachings on how to practice, your karma has been shifted and you will be born in a human life. 
with eight freedoms and ten advantages or in a Nirmanakaya pure land. So the Lama's kindness is inconceivable and it is very difficult to repay his or her kindness. And that's the, the level of devotion. And, and we see lots of examples of this in Tibet. I'm not sure it's surviving particularly well under the Chinese, but uh, there's still an element of that just, just really strong sense of devotion uh, to the value of these great teachers. And so that's what's trying to be uh, described here. Again, guru is in Sanskrit, lama in Tibetan, and the meaning is much greater than teacher in both Sanskrit and Tibetan. Teacher means whoever gives a teaching, as in a common education, but lama means one who gives you empowerments and instructions for practicing dharma. So when you call the lama teacher, we devalue the lama to a lower state. Therefore, it is better to call him or her guru or lama in the future. Continuing on, the third part of the instructions on following the guru are for emulating the teacher's realization and actions. And that's really the main focus of this third part that is the instruction for this particular day. After you understand how to follow the guru, try to emulate the guru's realization and actions. No one can achieve realization without a guru. Therefore, you need to follow for a very long time. And you need to achieve the guru's instructions for a long period of time. Uh, one of my most common instructions is patience and persistence. So it takes time to accomplish these things, but you have to stick with it. You need to persist in order to do that. So imitation of the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas in particular uh, which is described on page 153 in the words of my perfect teacher. Today the main challenge in the West or the East is that when the master is free the students are busy. Similarly when the students are free the master is busy. So this is a great obstacle for practicing Dharma. It is said in the per Perfection of Wisdom Sutra, the great scholars of the bygone ages attained the ultimate spiritual realization only after studying under the tutelage of a master for a prolonged period of time. So it does take a long time. Fortunately, it's usually a fairly rapid growth pattern in the beginning and then it kind of slows down. The closer you get it slows down a little bit because the teachings become increasingly more subtle and you have to, to spend a little bit more time working with them in order to, to push it closer and closer to enlightenment there. So we need to follow the Lama for a long time to receive as many Dharma teachings as we can. For example, Lopan Jampal Shenying followed Lopan Gerb Dorje for 75 years. It's a long time to follow a teacher. After that, he achieved the enlightenment and rainbow body. Lopan Sri Singha followed Lopan Jampal Shenyan for 25 years, and after that, he achieved rainbow body. Therefore, you also need to decide, I will follow the Guru for a very long time. I will receive many teachings from the Guru. I will achieve many accomplishments in this life. So we're making that commitment here. A, an important part of this particular practice is to focus on making a commitment, long-term practice, or a commitment to doing the practice in order to help us achieve enlightenment. And then when we've done the contemplation, we conclude by resting our mind and then again doing the dedication prayers as we did before. So this then completes the meditation on how to follow the guru, uh, which is the root practice of the great vehicle. So we'll take a little break here. <laughs>